Welcome everyone to the Online Ocean Symposium, the streaming video forum where we bring together experts and stakeholders to talk about climate and the ocean. Today we're going to be discussing ocean acidification, a byproduct of our world's changing climate and our impact on it. We have a fantastic panel joining me today, but before we get to them, I wanted to remind you at home that you can interact with us and ask us questions directly through the Hangout tool. So just click on the Ask Question and we will see it. So let's dive in. Uh, first off on the panel, we have Moose O'Donnell from the Ocean Science Trust. Welcome to uh, the program. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Fantastic. So um, what exactly is ocean acidification? So ocean acidification, that's a great question. Ocean acidification is a change in the fundamental chemistry of the waters of the ocean. And that's happening as we add carbon dioxide to it. And what is changing is a property of water called pH. And this is something that those of you who remember high school chemistry will remember is, is some important feature of, of any solution. And what happens is, as you add carbon dioxide to a solution, the pH goes down. And, and really, ocean acidification is nothing more than that. So let me give you a quick demo of what happens here. Um, experiment. What we've got here, we've got some water, pour it into a glass, um, and then we have a, a pH test kit. This is the same thing if, for those of you who've ever had to take care of a hot tub or a swimming pool. You remember you have to check the chemistry, and so you have these little things that you add, uh, you add water to, you add a little bit of this dye, and it will tell you right now, this is telling me, if you can see the colors here, that the pH of this water because it's pink, is probably something above 8.2. So the pH scale goes up and down. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add some carbon dioxide using a, a soda stream. So for those of you who like your bottling, your sparkling water, soda stream sells these cylinders of pure carbon dioxide. And I'm going to put some of that into the, into the water right now. And what it's going to do is it's going to lower the pH of the water. And you'll notice that as, the, as it, I add CO2, the color of this dye is going to turn yellow, um, indicating it's moving down this scale. Keep it from splashing water out. Oh, wow. And you can see it start to change color. And the pH now is down in the 7 range. And as it stirs in more, that's going to take it to lower and lower pHs. And ocean acidification is due to nothing more than that. It's, it's a shift in that... that fundamental chemical property of the ocean. And the, the bigger question is, why is it happening? Well, that's happening because we're changing the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. We're raising the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, by, by creating cement. Lots of processes are making more CO2. Um, so that's the main source of ocean acidification. Now, at the same time, we have other processes. This image on the screen is showing you other things that are changing the pH of the water. These are things like pollution runoff. Uh, there are certain pollutants, like those that cause acid rain, which directly lower the pH of the water. There are other issues where if you add nutrients to the water from fertilizer runoff, we often hear of those creating things called dead zones where, where there's something called hypoxia. There's no oxygen in the water. But the process of creating... Uh, or reducing the oxygen in the water also creates CO2, and that's another mechanism that's reducing the, the chemistry of the ocean, uh, reducing the pH of the ocean. So all of these processes together, but mostly the addition of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, is lowering this pH, it's changing the chemistry, and that's changing the way that the ocean works for all of the things that live there. So I have to ask, um, what are the potential impacts of ocean acidification? Why, why should those watching at home pay attention to this and, and care about what's happening? There are a lot of potential impacts. Like I said, pH is a fundamental property of the water, very much like temperature. It's something about it that matters to everything that's relying on seawater for life. The reason you care about the pH in your hot tub is because you want it, the pH conditions to be inhospitable to the algae that would otherwise grow there. And similarly, the pH conditions in the water are, are appropriate and conducive to the things that live there now. So shifts in that pH will change things like 
lots of things make their shells or their skeletons out of a material called calcium carbonate. If you change the pH of the water, that will, uh, that will become more difficult to do. Huh. So you can't be the only uh, group working on this. Uh, I believe that you're working with the West Coast Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Science Panel. Can you speak a yeah. little bit about this and, and their effort? Absolutely. This is a, a question. Right now, we're not asking the questions of, of, is this happening? But we're asking the questions of, what can we possibly do about this? And so uh, the California Ocean Protection Council, along with the West Coast Governors Alliance and, and another organization uh, called the Pacific Coast Collaborative, have teamed up to create a science panel to advise the states of Oregon, Washington, California, and British Columbia what do we need to know about ocean acidification and what do we need to think about to, uh, to begin to respond to it. And so what you're seeing now is the members of this panel. And these are people who are, are experts on ocean acidification, experts on hypoxia, who are trying to come up with a, a series of recommendations for decision makers about how they may need to respond, what future data we may need. And, and this is really driven by asking decision makers and policy makers questions about how they may plan to respond to this and what things are, are concerning them. And so then this panel is looking to come up with those answers. So uh, are they producing some sort of, you know, frequently asked questions about the West Coast or about ocean acidification in general? What, what's going on with that? Yeah, the, I, I, on my, my lower part of the screen is the website for the hypoxia panel, the West Coast Ocean Acidification Hypoxia Panel. And one of the first products that we're producing is a, a frequently asked questions document. Um, it, you can see it on that image if you, if you bring it up. Um, here's our website. And this frequently asked questions is actually building on one that Sarah Cooley, one of our other guests, put together at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. It answers the broader questions of what it is and how it's affecting the oceans. This document is, is very narrowly targeted on why are ocean acidification and hypoxia being treated together? And why is the West Coast a special place that's, that's getting its own panel and its own attention? And I really encourage you to, to go to the web address that, that I've listed there uh, to learn more about the panel and some of the things that, that we're doing to work on. And that website, just so everybody is uh, familiar, is westcoastoah.org. Correct. All right. Um, before I move on, since I live in California and the West Coast, why is the West Coast so you know, impacted by, why, why do we deserve our own panel? That's a great question. And the reason is mostly oceanographic. The, the ocean currents off the coast of California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia are what's called an upwelling ecosystem. The way the wind patterns blow along the shore has the tendency to push water away from the coast. And that water gets replaced by water that gets brought up from depth. Mm -hmm. And for a variety of biological reasons, that water that comes up from depth has very high CO2 levels and has very low pH. And mm -hmm. it means that organisms are, have, have seen, this is a natural process, organisms have seen a history of fluctuating pH conditions. But the atmospheric CO2 added on top of that is pushing the, the pH levels down even further than they've experienced. And so it means that, that many of these organisms may well be at the edge of, their, of what they can tolerate. So if you lower the pH more, they're going to be the first ones to, to potentially see impacts. So it, it's oceanography and biology are the reasons that, that the west coast of the U.S. is a sort of a special case that's getting its own panel. Interesting. Well, thank you for paying attention to the west coast and oceans and acidification in general. I know that I will be asking a couple of questions off of the Frequently Asked Questions uh, page. But since you introduced her, I'm going to drop it over to Sarah Cooley uh, from the Ocean, Con uh, Ocean Conservancy. Welcome to the program. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Th again, thank you for coming on. Can you tell us a little bit about your work with ocean acidification and the Ocean Con uh, Conservancy? Sure. Um, well, my work about, with ocean acidification started um, long before this. Um, I am a marine chemist by training, and um, for the past seven years, I was at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And I was working on ocean acidification um, as an issue, a chemical oceanographic issue. 
And then I started thinking about how we can uh, activate folks who are not marine chemists about this issue. And that led my research into an area looking at um, the consequences for humans. And um, so I started getting more active um, in issues like um, communicating about ocean acidification. And this January, I joined the Ocean Conservancy, which is in Washington, D.C. And um, we are a nonprofit that is working on um, shedding light on some of the issues that are affecting our oceans today that we can do something about. And ocean acidification is one of our priority areas. Mm. So, what has your been? What has been your experience since you are out of uh, Washington D.C. with ocean acidification, working with uh, that community and that level of politician? Is it gaining more momentum as an issue? Yes, actually, ocean acidification is gaining a lot of traction, not only here in D.C. at the federal level, but also at the state level. Um, ocean acidification is uh, a challenge when you come to the governance. It, question because it's a global problem caused by the rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide but it has these local effects mm -hmm. and um, as Moose was talking about the West Coast has seen some really profound effects already because of the unique oceanographic features that are happening out there and what we think from the science is that um, there are going to be a number of other areas that have um, ocean acidification um, sort of episodes that are emerging and so what we are doing is we're trying to help coordinate some of the efforts that are happening at the local level as well as efforts happening at the federal level. Um, not only has Washington State taken legislative action and now California is taking um, a state-based um, study panel sort of action, um, the Maine and Maryland have recently passed state bills of their own um, dedicated to studying the issue and figuring out exactly what implications acidification has for their citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually just this week um, we've had some very um, very positive movement in Washington. So on Tuesday um, Congresswoman Shelley Pingree introduced legislation um, looking that would require federal officials to analyze the risks of ocean acidification um, and uh, that it poses to coastal and island communities around the United States. And then on Thursday, Congressman Derek Kilmer and um, uh, Representative uh, Cap and Herrera, oh no, I'm sorry, Herrera Butler, who is a Republican, um, supported a bipartisan bill to spur new technologies and science innovations um, via a prize competition. So it would be very similar to the X Prize that Paul will be telling us about in a few minutes. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of action around acidification, um, certainly in terms of figuring out what we can do to understand the problem and all of its um, implications for human communities. And um, that's all sort of um, first steps as we learn about what we can actually do to stop ocean acidification. Because we know at the end of the day, cutting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is our best hope to mitigate ocean acidification or stop it completely. Well, I, I, I do have to ask in regards to those uh, pieces of legislation, both you know, in the state levels uh, and the federal levels, how can people pay attention or, or keep up to date on those? Uh, is there some housing for that? Is there some way to easily get involved or show support for those? Well, um, actually, Ocean Conservancy is tracking those, um, those activities, as you would imagine. Um, and we um, follow them pretty closely via social media, by Twitter, and by our website. Um, and we often um, uh, comment on a action that's um, newsworthy on our blog, um, the blog Aquatic. Um, but I would say that certainly um, you're going to find the breaking news coming out on the social media channels, especially Twitter. That's where we've seen the, the best, uh, best ways to track it. So if you follow the hashtag ocean acidification or if you follow the hashtag ocean and then acidification by itself, um, you can really get the latest. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely have to pay attention and follow you guys on Facebook, Twitter, and all those different streams. Um, ocean acidification is not a particularly visual issue. I know that uh, Moose's experiment showed us all, you know, a direct color coordination of the change, but how um, 
how do you get the public actually engaged about an issue like this where you can't really see it, you know, immediately? Right, that's a great question, and that's actually a question that really has shaped my own sort of uh, scholarly interest from, you know, just modeling ocean chemistry changes to really working out what the consequences could be for people. And um, the way that we can tell ocean acidification is affecting human communities is by stories like um, Terry's that we'll be hearing about in a few minutes. Um, and what we find is that folks who live and work um, near the water, who rely on marine resources for their income and their nutrition, um, are folks who are seeing profound changes in those marine resources. We're seeing changes in shellfish harvests. We're seeing other changes in the marine ecosystem that scientists are still trying to determine if ocean acidification is a piece of the puzzle um, that's causing those changes. And um, what we find is that um, we really get people's interest when we point out that this is affecting people who are our neighbors. Um, this is affecting folks we know in coastal communities. But at the same time, we can actually do something about it. Um, there have been a number of really um, groundbreakingly innovative um, approaches that have been taken to at least identify when ocean acidification is a problem for shellfish hatcheries um, and to uh, make workarounds happen so that harvest can be preserved um, while, uh, while ultimately carbon dioxide uh, atmospheric emissions are being cut. Um, we find that one of the things that works best is to really help the folks who are affected speak to the people who are making decisions. So at Ocean Conservancy, we spend a lot of effort to make those connections, to really um, get those voices um, of folks who are affected and concerned into the conversation and to have them um, discuss with their representatives exactly what, uh, why they're concerned and what exactly they would like to see done. And we also spend a lot of effort um, kind of distilling the science, uh, the best possible science about acidification into um, fact sheets and things like that that we can disseminate um, that will um, kind of distill the science and kind of help plug it right into the policy conversation where it needs to go, where the questions are arising. So we find that really um, making acidification local and immediate and something we can do something about is really, has really um, changed a lot of people's perspective on this big uh, problem. Well, that's a very excellent plan of attack. You mentioned stakeholders and bringing them into the conversation, and I'm going to use that segue to introduce Terry, uh, Terry Sawyer of Hogs Island Oyster Farm. Welcome to the uh, program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Hogs Island Oyster Farm? What what, what do you guys do? Besides well, you? it's it's Hog Island Oyster Company, and um, the uh, the issues that we've been facing here with what uh, um, Sarah was alluding to that we we've, we've gotten involved um, mainly because we have seen the problems showing up on our supply side, our supply side of, of what we call seed. The seed is going to be a, um, uh, it's, it's, it's our indicator, uh, and what's happening is, is that the availability of this seed has been dropping off um, over the past 10 years. And the availability is, is a very, um, obviously, very impactful if I can't buy seed from a hatchery. Uh, and these hatcheries are located up and down the west coast of the United States, uh, the, sort of the ground zero of what... Uh, Moose and Sarah have been talking about, um, and I, if I don't have that seed to plant um, on some species, I'm affected for the following year. On uh, other species, I might be affected for two to three years out, uh, because this is farming that we're talking about. It's not a fishery; it's farming. And so, what um, what I'm seeing is is that availability has fallen off, and uh, uh, we as an industry have been uh, trying to figure out what's going on. Where a lot of the seed was actually, uh, we're at the hatcheries, we're having a hundred percent die-off happening, and um, that's that's extremely disconcerting to say the least. Um, so we're we're um, we're directly impacted, and so what we've done is we've joined in uh, collaborations. Uh, not only with uh, California Current Acidification Network, uh, uh, with uh, 
Sankus with uh, uh, Bodega Bay Marine Laboratories, uh, part of UC Davis, uh, out here in California. And um, we are, are monitoring what's going on, not only at our, um, at our facility here in uh, Marin County, just north of San Francisco, but also we're building our own hatchery up in Humboldt County, and we're working on uh, getting monitoring going on there as well. So you've spoken a lot about the impacts of ocean acidification and the efforts that you're doing. Um, any way to, in a monetary aspect, just kind of describe to people watching at home how this could hypothetically impact your industry uh, in the short term and the long term? Well, um, if we're talking about an industry that's depending on an organism that's binding calcium carbonate out of uh, solution, um, and it's being stressed as we're seeing that usually uh, the stress is showing up at the metamorphic stages so when it's going from the larval to that actual miniature version of what I grow which is either the oysters, the mussels, or the clams um, that what's happening on a monetary basis would be a, a, a direct impact on my business. I have now 200 employees that I, I have uh, within my business and um, the impact would be if I don't have the product to sell, uh, to, to, to produce, to go to whatever uh, marketing that I'm, um, I've incorporated in my business, then I'm really not able to function. And the industry as a whole uh, is, is located um, it's in, has a reputation for a high quality product and uh, a very high uh, level production coming off uh, the west coast of the United States and we're as, as a country very very dependent on seafood coming in from outside sources we import most of our product if we're not able to offset that then uh, one we're, we're going to be uh, struggling as a society to be able to uh, have sustainable sources of food so as a as an epic economic, I can't really put a number on that for you because it's hypothetical. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can tell you, as a direct result of of this, I am I'm I'm uh, running out of product early, and I'm uh, unable to um, replace that unless I'm going to sources outside of my area in production. So that becomes no longer local. So I start to have to contribute to the CO2 impacts yeah. by shipping. So, you know, it's really, it's a bit of a conundrum that we're in. Is there anything that the people at home uh, can do to either help or be more informed about what you're going through um, or about the studies that you're, you're performing on your uh, oysters, etc.? Well, um, I think probably the messaging is crucial here. Um, uh, you know, if we were trying to talk to um, um, the general population about something that's that's one it's below the surface of the water you can't see it uh, but we're able to, sh to uh, show the effects and uh, whether it's the monitoring and showing what's the results of that is or actually showing the corrosion of, of, a, of a shell that's helpful but a lot of this information I mean we have to go on and make a living we have children we'll have grandchildren and, and you know uh, basically you want to um, provide information that's going to be offering solutions as opposed to just wanting to hit people with a really just the negative and and um, you know you just want to curl up in a fetal position uh, so I think really as a, as a whole the messaging is important the messaging needs to go to policymakers and we have to have paradigm shifts in behavior that are going to involve a lot of work a lot of research a lot of money uh, and we need to get our government on board with that and start looking at alternative forms of transportation, energy, etc. So, that's that's a pretty big request, but here's hoping that we can get it moved out there. You know, uh, talking about how it's a global issue that also affects the local economy. I'd love to throw it over to our next guest, um, but before I do, Terry, thank you so much for bringing this issue to a real world perspective about how it's affecting you, your business, and the local economy. Um, but Mark. Eakin from NOAA uh, would love to introduce you and to have you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing. Welcome to the program, by the way. Mark. 
Thank you very much. Glad to be with you, Andrew. Um, the work we do at NOAA's Coral Reef Watch is related to coral bleaching. Um, it's a close cousin to the problem we're talking about now in ocean acidification, and there's actually a tie between them, and I'll get to that in, in just a minute. But coral bleaching is another of the things that is being influenced greatly by the increase in carbon dioxide in our atmospheres. As the CO2 has increased in the atmosphere, as we've been seeing warming, we've been seeing more and more events where the temperatures rise to a point that the corals are not able to tolerate it. And corals are an interesting mix. Corals are a mix of animal, plant, and mineral. So if you think of that, 20, the, the children's game, 20 questions. You know, first, what's the first question? Is it animal, vegetable, or mineral? For corals, the answer is all three. Uh. And because of that, when the temperature gets hot, that relationship between the animal and these microscopic plants that live inside their tissues breaks down, and the corals actually eject the algae out of their skeletons. I'm going to show you a picture here so you can get an idea of what it looks like um, when corals are bleaching. And uh, I'll have that up just a moment. And this is a shot of uh, a, a series of corals uh, living on a reef in, in Thailand in 2010 when there was a major bleaching event. The water was so warm you not only weren't diving in a wetsuit, but even just a thin lycra skin felt too warm, and you were unzipping it and trying to get the water in. It was so so warm diving there. It's so you know, Mark, really quick. Um, right now, I don't know if other people are seeing this, but I am only seeing the file folder. Oh, gee, that, that's interesting. Okay, um, I brought it up, and can you see it now? Can you try share screen one more time? I will. Okay, this should do it. And there we go. Thank okay, you. thank you. Anyway, this was a severe bleaching event going on in Thailand in, in 2010. And the temperatures had gotten up high enough that the corals, all of these corals had been losing uh, these microscopic algae that live inside their tissues. This is really important because the corals serve as the basis of the food chain, chain on coral reefs and also provide the structure for the coral reefs. So it's sort of like losing a forest. Uh, you, you know, it, it, you don't have much of a forest if the trees are all gone. And when the corals are gone, you've got the same thing. So at this point, the corals you're looking at are severely bleached. They're in trouble. They haven't died yet. Many of them started dying within a few weeks after this photo was taken. And this breaks down the whole ecosystem. And, and coral reefs that are so valuable as, as the basis for fisheries, as uh, tourist attractions, and as, as breakwaters to help protect shorelines, you know, these are very important structures that we have to, to make sure and protect. Now, I, I said that this is connected to what goes on in uh, ocean acidification. The connection between the two is that coral reefs are being influenced by the temperature, and they're also being influenced by carbon dioxide at the same time. The increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is causing the warming, and we're seeing the coral bleaching. But the acidification is actually making it harder for corals to recover from coral bleaching events. After an event like this, corals die, new corals come in, they have to grow. Bleaching slows down the rate of coral growth, and at extremely high levels that are likely to be seen by the next century, it even gets to the point that you start dissolving corals, you start dissolving structures, you start losing a lot of what coral reefs are made of. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's a last piece of this, and some experiments have shown that as the ocean gets acidified, the corals become more susceptible to bleaching. So it may be that the, one of the reasons we're seeing as much bleaching as we are now is the combination of the acidification stressing the corals, the temperature stressing the corals, and you get more of this bleaching going on. So, you know, we were hearing from, from Terry, from Moose, from Sarah about some of the, the things that are going on on the West Coast, and these are very dynamic things that we're seeing now. The coral reefs are a little more subtle, but these are effects that uh, the ocean acidification is really starting to come uh, to, to be a problem, and we'll be seeing more of it in future decades. The bleaching, of course, is one that's already here. We've been seeing bleaching events for the last 
30 years, they've been getting more frequent, more intense, and it just keeps continuing. The, the, the last thing I'll say along those lines is we're especially worried right now because for those of you who haven't heard, uh, the forecasts are indicating that there's a very good chance there's going to be another El Nino coming up mm -hmm. in 2014, 2015, so it'll kick in at the end of this year. And this causes high temperatures that really cause problems in terms of coral bleaching. And so we're worried if there's going to be a large event or because of the warming we've been seeing as a background state, even if we get a moderate bleaching event, I mean a moderate El Nino in the next year, we may be seeing a lot of coral bleaching. And so that's just another piece of this whole puzzle. So really briefly, you've, stopped, you've talked really excellently about the effects of uh, acidification, the effects of high temperatures on coral, but if you could just drill home what the importance of coral is, the ecosystem and the ocean in, uh, uh, in general, very briefly, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, there's an expression that a lot of people use where they refer to the, the coral reefs as being the rainforest of the seas because they're the high diversity there. It turns out that coral reefs cover about one-tenth of one percent of all of the ocean floor, but probably have some 25 percent of all of the species found in the oceans. The diversity on reefs is huge. If you do the statistics, you find out that we actually have been seeing it backwards. The rainforests are the coral reefs of the land because the, ra the coral reefs are actually more diverse. So this diversity is a lot of exciting, important life that we have in the ocean. It's the basis for major fisheries. You've got half a billion to a billion people that rely on the fish from coral reefs as their source of food. It's a major source of, of a, a green tourism industry that draws people in to, to see these resources and brings money into the local economies. And as I was mentioning before, in terms of shoreline protection, when, when the, the big tsunami happened in uh, 2004 um, with the major um, uh, hurricanes that have come in in many places, those areas where the, the coral reefs have been broken down through local damage weren't as protected and suffered a lot more damage on land mm. from the waves because there was nothing to stop them. So things like coral reefs, mangroves, and other natural buffers on the shoreline are very important in protecting those communities that are living nearby. That's a really great way to drill at home. Um, you know, before I let you go, I have one last question. What really can be done to protect the fragile ecosystem of coral reefs? Is there, is there any good news? <laughs> There, there are a couple of things, and there, it's, this is really a one-two punch that we've got to be dealing to deal with this. One is the one that's been coming in repeatedly and will come in with, with other discussions here. The first thing we've got to do is reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, you'll notice I didn't say slow down the amount we add to the atmosphere because we're actually already past the point that the corals are healthy. We not only have to quit adding more, but we've got to start backing it up. Mm. That's number one, the global issue, and that's a big picture, and a lot of people have trouble getting their hands around that. The other one is there are major threats to coral reefs from a lot of local things, overfishing or improper fishing, pollution running offshore, habitat destruction, um, poor land use. There are a lot of things of that sort that really influence corals, and what we have to do is at the same time that we're trying to deal with getting the carbon dioxide issue under control. We've got to be you know, working on those reefs, trying to protect them and keep them as healthy as we can so that they can live long enough for us to deal with the CO2 problem. Gotcha. Um, well, again, thank you so much for speaking on coral. You're just hoping that we can uh, dial back our output and our impact. For a bit of more good news, or possible good news, I'd love to welcome back to the Online Ocean Symposium Paul Bungie of the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Prize uh, from XPRIZE. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Andrew, for having me here. No problem. Uh, the XPRIZE, for those who may not know, is an organization through competitions, monetary awards, and other things, tries to encourage advances for the betterment of humanity. Last time you were on, you mentioned uh, Wendy Schmidt Ocean Prize, which deals with the question currently of ocean acidification. Can you 
refresh us a bit on this prize and why this competition is important? Yeah, no, this, uh, we, we talked a bit about this last time, but it sort of backs up to all of the issues that, that everybody has been talking about today, which starts with the fundamental premise that we can't solve these grand challenges like ocean acidification if we don't have the tools to measure them. And so, beginning a few years ago, we started analyzing this, this growing problem and the, the alarm that was being, being sounded by a lot of scientists and, and other experts around the world, and said, okay, well, wh what is it that we can do to rapidly transform our ability to respond to something like ocean acidification? And it became clear that fundamentally anything we might be doing, whether it's understanding or, or resolving local issues, is going to require devices and tools that give uh, give managers, experts, citizens, and, and others the, uh, the information that they need to respond. So, the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize was born, launched last September, and it's a $2 million competition for radically, uh, radically transformative breakthrough devices that will allow anyone, essentially, scientists all the way down to you and me, the ability to measure what the pH of the ocean is, uh, how it's changing, and to have the confidence to know that we can then respond with exactly uh, the right response. So basically to have better information so we can attack the problem better. Yeah, and that's, you know, when, when you look at a grand challenge, you sometimes have to break it down into its fundamental pieces, right? I, I would love to s stop all the CO2 uh, emissions now, and as, as Mark was saying, start start sucking mm -hmm. it out of the atmosphere as well. I'd also love to be able to to tell every single marine manager that's, that's working with, with coral reefs or every uh, oyster hatchery uh, like what Terry's working with, exactly how they can respond, but we quite frankly don't even have the, uh, the tools. They're not cheap enough, they're not accurate enough, they're not robust and durable enough to allow everybody to have access to that kind of data, fundamentally about data. And so we start with, with sort of two, two, two pieces of knowledge. Number one, um, you're not going to be able to address issues even locally unless you have data that tells you what to do. Mm -hmm. Number two, and maybe even more importantly or more impactfully, if you want the world to care and start thinking about the even grander solutions to this grand challenge, you need to be able to populate people with awareness, knowledge, and empower them with the type of information that allows them to take what's important to them locally onto a national or global scale. And so we really do think this is the kind of information that will come out of these really remarkable devices, things that are quite frankly going to be, be a, a, you know, orders of magnitude more effective and, and affordable than anything you, you we've got today, if people will be able to take that and turn that into the kind of knowledge that they can both act today in their own uh, habitats, companies, etc., but also that they can take and share with their friends, share with their colleagues, share with their representatives, share with others to try and empower through the, through the power of knowledge folks to make decisions that will ultimately help protect us in the long run from the growing threat that everyone has been been alluding to. Throwing it back to my childhood, there was an old saying that knowledge is power. So you got it. yeah, great to see that continue to uh, be the main driving message. Uh, really curious, um, how, uh, how have the submissions been for this so far? Um, have you found any interesting ones? Uh, anything exciting? What can you share with us? Uh, I, I can share a lot of super exciting stuff. So, it, it, just really briefly, one of the reasons we do this, these types of X prizes, is is not just to solve the, the problem at hand, but, rec but to recognize that if we can focus a community and grow that community exponentially, then we've got power in numbers that are going to be able to then take on even greater challenges. So, by focusing folks. On a, on, on a specific problem, measuring pH in the world's oceans, every part of the world's oceans. We're also bringing in members of technological and scientific expertise and other places around the world that can now be applied to one specific ocean issue, and what we're seeing is them starting to be interested in measuring other parts of ocean chemistry or the physics of the ocean, mm -hmm. and, and thus growing an entire industry around measuring uh, what's happening in the seas, which is absolutely at the at the base of the pyramid of solving solving these grand challenges that it might include things like warming that are also affecting um, uh, coral reefs that Mark was referring to. So as a result of that, we're really excited by some of the submissions. We've had, to date, 70 teams, 70, 70, from around the world, 19 different countries, submit their intent to compete for the competition. Uh, we still have registration open. 20 teams already have submitted registration fees, put some skin in the game, as it were, and are ready to compete. 
uh, which means that we've already got more that have said that they're going to compete than I was aware of any manufacturers of these devices to begin with more already than, than I was aware had already existed. Uh, and like I said, they're coming from 19 different countries around the world so far, if anybody's out there listening from... Um, I don't think we have any Brazilian teams yet. We've got South Africa and India and Indonesia and, uh, and France and, and the Netherlands and uh, Canada, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it goes on and on. Bringing ideas to this field that haven't ever been brought before, right? So uh, we've got one team, one of my favorite teams based out of Texas, uh, that is coming from a nanotechnology background. And they have a small company that makes nanotechnology sensing devices and have recognized that you can utilize uh, nanomachines, essentially, to measure pH, to measure hydrogen ions on, on, a, on a finite level, turning that into the type of device that can cheaply and extremely accurately devise these. Uh, one of the reasons we love the team is not only are they, are they clever and interesting, run by a woman named Huma Jaffrey, uh, but they are, are thinking outside the box on multiple efforts. And in fact, they found out about the competition because Huma's brother is competing in the Google Lunar X Prize, which is a $30 million prize to put a lunar lander on the moon, which means uh, you know, sort, of, sort of recognizing that, that people have different expertises, and if they can learn that they might be able to cleverly apply it to this new challenge, there's new things they can do. Uh, we've got another team out of, out of the Netherlands that's using uh, uh, wearable technology pH sensing, right? And they've been thinking about sensing pH and sweat as a, as a, uh, as a wearable uh, medical device for a long time and are now using that and turning it into something that can measure the pH cheaply in the world's oceans, coming out of the medical device technology field. We've got other biotechnology firms, uh, including some from up in the Bay Area there, that are thinking uh, of new ways that they can take ways you might be measuring intravenous pH, so the pH of your blood, uh, and measuring instead uh, the ocean's pH. Huh. One of the things I love about that approach is that um, for anyone who's familiar with, with the pH of the blood, it also has to exist in a very narrow band in order to keep humans healthy. And that narrow band is pretty similar to the world's oceans, and if you go outside of about 0.2 pH units, i.e. the amount that the world's oceans have changed already, if a human body, if your blood goes 0.2 pH units lower, you're in the hospital, and you're, you're, you're quite frankly nearing death in a, in a, in a condition known as acidosis. Uh, so it's analogous, quite more than analogous in some ways to what's happening in the oceans, which is why I'm excited that we've got these teams that are coming from that, that perspective. Um, we've also got, we've got a robotics club from the Indian Institute of Mines. We've got a high school team from, from North, uh, upstate New York that's building these, There's several different university teams, a lot of experts in existing ocean sensing technology, folks that have been building ocean pH sensors for many years, but are now being challenged to do it even more accurately, more robustly, something more than they were otherwise going to do. So, yeah, I, I could go on and on about the teams, but these guys are champions. I mean, they're, they're remarkable in, in the ways that they're thinking about innovating for all of our benefit. That's fantastic. I, it's great to hear about all these different teams. Um, is there a way to is there a way to monitor these teams or see like what the different teams have been put in yet or is that like something that you're going to be putting in later? I'm glad, I'm glad you are. Oh, hello? No. You got our web page there? On. Uh, Thanks, there we go. Everybody's not already following us, go to oceanhealth.xprize.org, uh, which is our website. If you sign up your name right in the top there in the email address, you're going to be following everything that's going on here. If you think you can compete, right, there's three ways you can really be involved. You can compete. and We're still looking for teams. You can register through June 30th. Um, and by if you think you can compete, I mean, do you think you even have the kernel of an idea that might apply to this? And that kernel of an idea might be even, I know how to better prevent algae from growing on pH sensors in the ocean. I know something about biofouling. Or I have a clever idea about how to reduce the power supply demands of these so that they can stay out longer. So you might actually remarkable tinkerer hanging out in the garage. Tell, uh, tell your cousin, tell your friends, go on, click on that button, sign up today um, to, to be a member of the team. And even if you don't have the full team available, once you've signed up your intent to compete, you can enter into our marketplace where you can actually engage with the other teams, merge with other teams, find other expertise. We're there to help you as well. You can engage with us to find out ways of doing that. You really don't think you are, but you're psyched on learning about these teams. Make sure that you sign up uh, on, the, on the Ocean Ambassador site right there at the top. Get your email address. 
And as soon as we close registration, so on July 1st, the day after we close these, you're going to see under that Teams button information about all of those teams. You'll be able to follow them. You'll be able to tweet with them. You'll be able to interact with them, champion them, tell them about your uh, uncle who works on Wall Street that's really interested in investing in, in breakthrough sensor technologies. Whatever it is, all the help we can get, this is about the crowd coming together and, uh, and changing the way the world works through um, what we hope, a $2 million competition, a lot of money, what we hope is really just the, the very beginning of a multi-million dollar effort in measuring and solving ocean acidification. Wow. Uh, I would have to say, you know, panelists, let's get together and uh, form a team. But really, anybody watching at home, you know, that's just your cue. If you have an idea, head on over and sign up. Thank you so much, Paul, for uh, bringing all this to our attention. That's really fantastic. Um, before we move on to the discussion portion of the Hangout, I wanted to remind everybody at home, we've already got some questions in the, in, in the, uh, in the back burner waiting to be answered, but you can answer, uh, sorry, you can ask questions at home through the Google Plus Hangout uh, apparatus or even through YouTube. You just click on the Interact Q&A and ask a question, we will see it. Um, with our remaining time, it's time to go to discussion questions. So I'd love to throw it to the panel. You know, we've spoken a little bit of this, um, you know, but how urgent is this issue for you in relation to other threats facing the ocean, like marine debris um, uh, or even sounding, things like that? Um, I'd love to throw it over to, um, to Mark, who uh, has spoken a little bit to this, but I would love if you could uh, expand upon this a little bit. So, you know, I think this is one of these things that really depends on where you are. Right now, this is already a pressing issue in the, in the Northwest. I mean, we, we've, we've heard a bit from, uh, from Terry, and I, I've talked with uh, some of the other people who are involved in shell fishing industry who have been affected by, by this, and this is a now issue up in those areas. In terms of coral reefs, you know, we're dealing with bleaching as a much bigger issue right now with the acidification following a bit behind. So for us, we're more concerned about the bleaching, but hey, you know, we solve both of them if we can deal if we can get the CO2 problem under control. So it's it's not something that we necessarily need to completely separate these out. Um, there are a lot of issues and, and a lot of these things all come together and there are a lot of parts of our ecosystem that are being influenced at the same time by different things. Warming, pollution, acidification, uh, you know, habitat destruction, there are a lot of things out there. And so rather than it being which one do we deal with first, I think we really need to be working on them all together. Plus this is a long, slow one to take care of. So we got to get started on this quick, or it's going to be a you know that much longer before it gets solved. Moose, do you have a, a bit of input on this? Oh, wait, you're unfortunately muted right now. Sorry about that. All good. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that like you said, there's the the big things we need to do is is get working on it now because. Um, there are it's a long slow ship to turn around and the other really important thing is is deciding which are the most important issues you have to keep in mind that these issues interact so an organism that is is spending extra energy balancing its its regulating its acid base balance in its or in its systems has less energy available for other parts of its other parts of its life it has less energy available for reproduction and, and it's, it's entirely possible that the corals have less ability to deal with whatever is causing them to bleach because they're also having to regulate against a different pH gradient. So it's important to not treat these as separate issues and say, well, this other one is more important so we can ignore the less important one. But keep in mind that they are suites of issues that need to be considered together. You know, I think that actually addresses this pretty well unless somebody else wanted to comment on this specific question. I love the idea that it's all these different problems that we all have to address, and ocean acidification is a large one that we have to address. That's going to take a while. Um, since we have a, uh, since we have some really great questions, and we're starting to run out of time, I'd love to throw it um, to the panel. Uh, we have a question from Martin Lewitt saying, um, "Have you seen any acidification studies attribute?" 
uh, sorry, attributable to CO2 increases comparable to the atmospheric increases, question mark. All the studies I've seen require much higher levels of CO2 achievable only by deep water upwelling. It seems to stretch to relate to 400 parts uh, per million, I believe, uh, CO2. So, let me let me take a crack at this uh, because it it is an, it is a good question and a couple of things that go into answering that. In the first place, you have to keep in mind that this is a very young research field that we've really only been doing scientific studies on ocean acidification for about a decade. And when you start a scientific field, the most important thing to do is to, to look to see whether an effect exists, and then you can start trying to tease out the details of that. And so in looking at those previous studies, if you go back about a dozen years, people were looking at many thousands of microatmospheres of carbon dioxide, much higher than we're expecting. Partially they were doing that. They had, they had different reasons why they were studying it, but they also wanted to see whether an effect existed. And now that we've identified where those effects exist, people are starting to do more subtle studies. They're able to look not just at whether organisms are, are living or dying, but they're able to look at their physiology, looking at whether different, different genes are getting turned on. And those are tests that can respond to much lower levels of CO2. So we are starting to see those, those differences. And saying that, that the levels in the experiments are much higher than the 400 microatmospheres, this is the point that, for instance, off the west coast of North America, the levels are, are frequently much higher. Seeing 700 or 900 microatmospheres is not at all an unusual occurrence. And yet any signal that we add on top of that is, is going to just, just add those, push those levels higher. And finally, I'll point out that, that when this field got started, around a decade ago, researchers are talking about the current atmospheric CO2 levels are 380, 390 microatmospheres. Now we're talking about them at 400 microatmospheres. That's in the last decade. These have been going up rapidly, and, and unless we do something radically different, they're going to continue to go up rapidly. So saying, wow, it's, it's much higher than, than 400, um, misses the point that, that within 100 years, we are going to be at atmospheric CO2 levels that are much higher than 400, and we really need to see whether those effects are going to, are going to where, where those effects are going to materialize. Thanks. Really great uh, answer to a really interesting question. Um, so, to the panel, and I believe Sarah, you could speak a bit to this. Um, there are efforts to create artificial carbon scrubbers that would pull carbon dioxide directly from the air and sea, and various other. Uh, artificial mechanisms like that. Um, sorry, uh, that wasn't actually to Sarah. That was going to be to uh, Mark, actually, if you could speak to this. Um, are efforts like this to create artificial, basically, trees or mechanisms to pull CO2 from the atmosphere and ocean, are they worth it, uh, both monetarily and effort-wise? Uh, where should we be focusing our attention? Well, it's so do I have my OST? Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so far, most of these are fairly expensive and, and hard to do. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice idea, and in fact, because we're dealing with CO2 levels that are so much higher already than what many of these organisms can tolerate, the idea of getting CO2 down is a good one. It certainly is a whole lot better than some of these ideas of putting up space balloons or sulfur dioxide gases in the atmosphere to cool the you know, to reduce the light coming in and cool things which don't do anything for acidification. But the, the real perspective that I'd like to put on is uh, I was at a meeting hearing a presentation by a uh, vice president of one of the major uh, U.S. Uh, energy companies, and he said the cheapest emissions that I can deal with are the ones that I never put into the air. Mm. So I think that's really the point. Once you've let the genie out of the bottle, it's a whole lot tougher to put it back. So we really need to be dealing with that up front even sooner than dealing with the, uh, the issue of, uh, of trying to suck it out. Totally. Um, now I would love to throw the actual question I was going to throw to Sarah, to Sarah, which was um, asked by um, Yoko Savage. 
Um, what are some ambitious but realistic things that local and state governments can do to prevent ocean acidification? You know, Mark, actually, I think Mark set me up really well um, because um, that's uh, scrubbers and things like that are sort of an, one instance of something that we could do to ameliorate the problem after it's happened. Um, there are a number of ways you can think about actions that can be taken. Um, policy actions can be uh, kind of taken from the top down, you know, kind of assuming we understand the system and all the major uh, influences on the marine ecosystem and how we can uh, play with those uh, influences to get an outcome. And that's sort of the best case optimistic scenario. Like we know that if we cut CO2, we're going to get this effect in this particular um, uh, you know, embayment, which we don't know yet. But we can kind of do some policies um, on a precautionary basis, things that sort of help preserve the health of a regional ecosystem um, so that it can withstand other pressures like warming and acidification that are undoubtedly going to be happening at the same time. And there's been some really great instances of that happening in the Pacific Northwest, kind of as a piece of some of the action that's been happening in Washington State. Um, there has been a um, methane biodigester installed, I believe, in the um, Tulalip tribe, um, uh, some of the farmlands there, to um, actually take out some of the um, agricultural wastes that were uh, getting into the waterways and adding to the ocean acidification problem by creating additional carbon dioxide. And so that's, you know, kind of creating spaces in which you can, um, you can, you can uh, solve some of the other things that are worsening ocean acidification are very realistic on a very local basis. Um, there's also some, another way that you can um, kind of uh, foster action, and that's creating spaces for, um, for innovation to come up. And actually, the X Prize is a great private uh, philanthropic example of that, as is um, the bill that was uh, put forth this week to um, allow the federal ocean acidification programs the ability to run that as well. And so that kind of allows a greater connection with the business side of um, the stakeholders in a coastal community and saying, you know what, you guys have great ideas. Let's see if we can bring those um, to the fore to the fore and, and get that, um, get some action there. There are also some um, activities that are ongoing right now um, where the um, Pacific, uh, uh, the, w the West Coast uh, coastal states and British Columbia have um, gotten together in what's known as the Pacific uh, Coast Collaborative, I believe. And um, the ultimate goal is for these, uh, these org um, governance units to get together and come up with a plan about how to deal with carbon dioxide regionally and to cut emissions regionally. And so there's a number of different scaled activities that people can do from eliminating additional stressors or from allowing innovation in creative ways or really tackling that carbon dioxide problem um, head on. And you can do that from the very local to the regional scale. And things like that are really getting some traction. So, and I think we haven't seen the end of the innovative uh, ways that uh, regions can use to tackle ocean acidification. That's sort of just a, a quick overview of what we've seen so far. Well, that's a really inclusive, really interesting uh, overview, and hopefully some of those efforts, you know, we can use as case studies for further, you know, development. I, I'd love to throw it to another question, um, since you actually mentioned XPRIZE. There's a question on, from one of our viewers that said, uh, Sorry, that actually says, um, is the goal of the contest, the X Prize Wendy Schmidt uh, Ocean Contest, to have a Keelung curve model for ocean acidification? So the, uh, the Keeling curve, which is produced, started uh, by the Keelings and runs still by the Keelings at a Scripps Institution of, of changing CO2 in the atmosphere um, over time is a remarkable device, not only for scientists, but also for the public to see what's been happening over the last 60 years, essentially, of, of our, our atmosphere. We don't have that for the oceans, and so the short answer is yes. Um, what we're hoping is that with devices that can be deployed in every part of the oceans, deep sea, coastal, here uh, in, in, in the southern ocean, in the Pacific, et cetera, et cetera, we'll be able to have the kind of data that will enable and empower everyone to respond. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be a lot more robust. and. We at XPRIZE have a, a belief that we need more people and more markets actually utilizing this kind of information in order 
to drive change behind things. And so we're actually excited to see what happens with the data. What, what sorts of, of new products or new services might be enabled by having data and information about ocean pH? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm excited to see, and that's one of those things where if there's other, other folks out there that are interested in ocean data, please sign up and join us, and, and maybe you'll be the next person building a, a big company that, that, that commodifies ocean data that allows folks like Terry to, 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 to know four years out what's going to happen to his, his oyster seed, for instance. Speaking of Terry, uh, I was wondering if you could uh, bring us back to the high levels in, in, in the experiments that you are currently checking out and the uh, data that you're getting from your actual oysters. So what I'm seeing now, it's, it's really it's at my intake uh, that I have an instrumentation package. Uh, and because it was all sort of early on in the, um, uh, implement, the deployment of this package that I have, um, we're only getting the information once a month on the download when we bring the equipment in to be calibrated, cleaned, and then we download the information. What we're seeing is, is in certain times of the year, uh, let's say July and August, when we have the um, uh, sort of the, the upwelling season sort of uh, dwindling off and the uh, uh, some hypoxic events happening off the coast, we're seeing a coincidence of lower oxygen levels with the um, lower pH showing up on our um, our instruments. Um, what it does for me is uh, it allows me to sort of identify if I have seed that's actually uh, seeing that water. I, it's allowing me to actually uh, uh, sort of make adjustments, but it's a little bit too late. So that's why I'm moving actually to a real-time uh, instrumentation um, uh, package that I'm installing actually this next week. And from a management point of view, it'll allow me to... Um, if I've got seed, to be able to, let's say, turn off my intake, supplying that raw water, and just go into a recirculating mode, and then uh, maybe even bubble oxygen into the water to sort of uh, address some of the lower oxygen levels. At least I can do that. Well, thank you for uh, fielding that question. Since we are pretty much over time, I would love to allow uh, people to sign off uh, let's start off with Paul. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know you got to go. Can you give a few last words? Yeah, thanks, you guys, for uh, letting me join. I uh, look forward to the next one. This is awesome. Fantastic. Um, there was one last question that accidentally got erased, but for the uh, remaining panelists as a sign-off, I was wondering if you had any quick ideas as a slogan or bumper sticker for ocean acidification awareness. So since uh, Terry, it affects you directly the most, I'd love to throw it to you first. Oh, good one. A bumper sticker, eh? Um, you know, um, uh, I, I could be sort of uh, self-promoting and just uh, say, um, eat more uh, oysters and keep your finger on the pulse of the pH. Not bad. Uh, Sarah, what about you? Kind of putting everybody on the spot. Nice. <laughs> yeah, this is a tough one. Uh, after the end of a long week, I think I'd be... Um, I think I'd be... I'd want to have some idea... You know, I'd want to incorporate the idea that um, if you're looking at my bumper sitting in traffic, we're all <laughs> contributing to it. Turn off your car. <laughs> <laughs> Not yeah. very short enough for a bumper sticker, but I can work with that. That's a great question. That's a great comment and a great uh, perspective on that. Uh, Moose, what about you? Uh, sorry, you're muted. I'm going to cheat because the people in my office who are watching this uh, shouted a good one out to me while <laughs> that came up. Uh, they suggested drop the base on ocean acidification. Nice. Not Ooh. bad. Drop the base on ocean acidification. <laughs> That's a bit of a science nerdy one for everybody. Uh, Mark, what about you? Oh, ocean acidification is osteoporosis of the seas. Treat it now and keep your ocean that's, that, that's healthy. A, that's a bit of a long bumper sticker, but not a bad slogan. 
Um, for myself, I would probably have to second drop the bass. That's pretty, pretty clever, and I'm just going to shy away from being creative on that one since this has been a really fantastic, really awesome hangout. Really thank you to everybody who asked questions at home and watched at home. And again, thank you so much to my panelists for participating and hope to see you all in the next uh, Ocean Symposium. And for those of you at home, remember to drop the base on Ocean Civication and be aware of your impact. So thank you all and uh, see you again next time. Thanks very much.